Hello, my name is Dr. Omenda. In this lecture series, I'm going to discuss the gross anatomy of the back in detail. So um, it's going to be very intense, but I'll try and break it down and make it as simple as possible. So anatomy of the, of the back. So um, from the surface, there's the skin and subcutaneous tissue below the subcutaneous tissue we have muscles so we have a superficial uh, layer of muscles and these are mainly for the positioning of the trunk and moving the uh, limbs then you have the deeper layers so basically the superficial muscles act on the limbs and the deep muscles of the back which are the true back muscles are mainly for uh, positioning the axial skeleton to maintain posture Deep under the muscles, we have bones. So we have the vertebral column that extends from the base of the skull to the apex of the coccyx bone. And the vertebral column is approximately 72 to 75 centimeters long. In between the vertebra that form the vertebral column, we have the intervertebral discs, and these occupy a quarter of the whole length of the vertebral column. And the vertebra are held together by associated ligaments. Then we have the ribs in the thoracic region, and this extends towards the back at the thoracic region. Therefore, um, the posterior portions and the medial to the angle of the ribs form the components of the back. What is the function of the vertebral column? It protects the spinal cord and spinal nerves. Remember, the spinal cord is housed within the vertebral canal of the vertebra. Then, the vertebral column supports the uh, body weight above um, the level of the pelvis. And then it provides a rigid and flexible axis to, uh, for the body and an extended base to which the head is placed. The vertebral column plays a major role in posture and locomotion. So you're able to move from one uh, place to another and the vertebral column plays a very, very important role. So we'll start by discussing the vertebra. We have 33 vertebra, where 7 are located in the cervical region, 12 in the thoracic region, 5 in lumbar and sacral region, and 4 coccygeal vertebra. Motion is mainly significantly um, seen within the first 25 superior vertebra. The last 9 inferior vertebra, where you have 5 sacral vertebra, they are actually fused in an adult. and the coccyx, after the age of 30 years, four of them fuse, the coccygeal vertebra fuse to form the coccyx. Sacral vertebra, the five of them fuse to form the sacrum. Between the lumbar and the sacral, in the first sacral vertebra, we have the lumbosacral angle. So the long axis of the lumbar region and that of the sacrum, together they form a lumbosacral angle. Now, the vertebra, as you move from cervical going downwards, they actually become larger towards the sacrum. But as you start with the coccyx, they, they become smaller and towards the apex, it's a, that's the smallest portion. So why is there a successive increase in the size of vertebra to the sacrum? Because of increasing the amount of body weight that the column is carrying. And they reach maximum size immediately superior to the sacrum. Remember, the sacrum mainly transfers weight to the pelvic girdle at the sacroiliac joint. So you have the weight, um, from the sacrum, how does it get to the lower limbs through the sacroiliac joint? So these are the seven cervical vertebra, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and you can see the tip of the uh, coccyx. I said vertebral column is made up of the vertebra and in between you have the intervertebral discs. So, um, what are the factors that help with the flexibility of the vertebral column? Number one, the fact that the vertebra are small bones. Number two, the intervert in between are actually resilient. And then we have what you call egopophysial joints. These are synovial joints that are located between the first 25 vertebra that form the vertebral column. The first 25 vertebra that form the vertebral column are uh, joined together by synovial joints, which you call zygopophysial joints, and this increase the movement in the vertebral column. So there is a small movement between two adjacent vertebra, but if you collectively look at all the vertebra, these small, small movements between two vertebra 
together, um, they form a flexible yet rigid column. So it's flexible, you're able to move, but it's rigid enough to protect the spinal cord. What are the parts of a typical vertebra? Typical vertebra has a vertebral, as you can see, this is the body. You have vertebral arc, so all this forms the vertebral. This is vertebral body, then you have vertebral arc, and then you have the processes. So there are seven vertebral processes. You have a spinous process, and you have the uh, transverse processes, as well as articular uh, um, processes. So you have superior and inferior articular um, processes. So again, you have vertebral body and vertebral arc. So then you have spinous process at the back. This is the pedicle separated uh, from the vertebral body. You have the pedicle that leads you to the transverse process. And from the transverse process, posterior is the lamina. From vertebral body to the pedicles. And then you have your transverse process. But posteriorly, you have your lamina. So this is your vertebral canal. This is where the spinal cord passes. So anteriorly on the vertebral canal, you have the pedicles. Posteriorly, you have the lamina, and this is the spinous process. Then vertebra articulate with each other on this superior and inferior articular facets. Okay. So the vertebral body, it's usually massive and cylindrical on the anterior part and gives strength to the vertebral column. That's where the body weight is transmitted. So there's an increase in size as you descend downwards. And this increase in size, mainly you see it from the fourth thoracic vertebra as you go downwards because you're increasing the body weight. So the vertebral body has an inner vascular part, which is trabecular, to mean that it, con it contains the spongy cancellous bone. So this is made up of a meshwork of trabecular and red marrow. Then, so the body has an inner vascular or trabecular bone and an outer compact bone. The posterior surface of the vertebral body has foramina for the bacivertebral veins, which usually drain the bone marrow within the vertebra. So this is your vertebral body. It usually has a superior surface, okay, superior surface and inferior surface, and these are actually the vertebral ends, end plate. So superior surface, which is a vertebral end plate, and inferior surface, which is a vertebral end, end plate. And this end plate is usually covered by hyaline discs and these are remnants of the cartilaginous models remember these bones develop endochondrally from hyaline pre-existing hyaline cartilage so the remnants of this hyaline cartilage they line their uh, superior and inferior uh, vertebral end plates what are the functions of this annular epiphysis they serve as growth zones they also protect the vertebral body and allow diffusion of fluid between the iv disc and capillaries in the vertebra. Remember, this is the intervertebral disc. It's made up of annulus fibrosus outside and inside the nucleus pulposus. So you're able to allow this end plate of hyaline cartilage is able to allow diffusion of fluid from the intervertebral disc to the blood capillaries in the vertebral body. So this annular epiphysis, which are the cartilaginous hyaline discs, they allow growth, they protect the vertebral bodies and allow that diffusion between the vertebra and the IV discs. So this epiphysis usually unite with the centrum, and the centrum is a primary ossification center, which is the central mass of the vertebral body. And this occurs at the age of 25 years. So this just shows you a superior end plate and an inferior end plate. So there's an end plate here, there's an end plate here, and this is the trabecular bone, and the outside is a compact bone. Most of the weight, 70%, is uh, uh, directed on the body, while 30% on the other parts of the disc of the vertebra. This is your intervertebral disc, containing an outer annulus fibrosus and an inner nucleus pulposus. So you can appreciate appreciate the hyaline cartilage there. Okay. So we have the vertebral arc. So the vertebra contains a vertebral body anteriorly, and everything posteriorly is the vertebral arc. So you have um, the arc located posterior to the body and it has two pedicels, right and left. So from the body, you have your pedicels, right and left. And this, sorry, the pedicles. And these pedicles are usually short, stout, and cylindrical, short, stout, and cylindrical, and project posteriorly from the vertebral body. Then they meet at the lamina, which are two broad, flat plates. Yeah, 
which unite in the midline. Two broad flat plates will unite in the midline and extend posteriorly as the spinous process. So this is the body, these are the pedicels, and these are the lamina. So this forms your vertebral arc. We have a vertebral foramen, and um, the walls are formed by the vertebral arc and posterior surface of vertebral body. The walls, this is vertebral foramen. The walls are formed by the vertebral arc and posterior surface of the vertebral body. Then we have vertebral canal or spinal canal. Two successive vertebrae have vertebral foramina. When the two of them join, they form a vertebral canal. And this usually vary in size and shape to accommodate the varying thickness of the spinal cord. So this is the vertebral canal here, okay, allowing the spinal nerves. So these are the vertebral foramina. Below the vertebra, this is the vertebral foramina of this vertebra and the next one. So two successive vertebra, their foramina unite to form a canal. And this canal usually contains spinal cord in the roots of the nerve, meninges, fats, and vessels. So spinal nerves emerging from the uh, spinal nerve roots emerging from the spinal cord, and these are covered by with meninges, but together with them we also have fat and blood vessels. So you can see the spinal nerves okay vertebral notches are indentations on the lateral uh, view of the vertebra superior and inferior to each pedicles and these are between superior and inferior articular processes so they form these notches will form intervertebral foramina actually these are actually the intervertebral foramina that we are discussing here with the spinal roots coming from the spinal cord and they're covered by meninges okay and the intervertebral foramina are formed by the vertebral notches as well as adjacent iv discs connecting them so you can see vertebral notch and an iv disc connecting them so you form your um, intervertebral foramina so they're usually located um, this intervertebral foramina they provide the location of the the root ganglion the dorsal root ganglion okay that's the dorsal root ganglion there. And they transmit spinal nerves and accompanying vessels. So this is the intervertebral foramen with spinal nerves, dorsal root, and accompanying vessels. And it's formed by the notch, vertebral notch of successive vertebra and the IV disc in between them. So you have seven processes arising from the vertebral arc. You have one median spinous process that runs posterior inferiorly. So the two laminae, posteriorly form you can see the two laminae joined to form the spinous process then you have two transverse processes that run posterior laterally at the junction between pedicles and lamina the junction between pedicles and lamina you have your two transverse processes going posterior laterally and then you have four articular processes two superior and two inferior this arise at the junction between the pedicles and the lamina so these are the articular processes two superior and two, you have two inferior ones. Okay, so spinous process, transverse processes, two superior and two inferior articular processes. What are the functions of these seven processes? The spinous and transverse processes act as attachment of muscles and also levers. So the muscles can um, change uh, the position of the vertebra through acting these processes acting as levers so muscle attachment and acting as levers then we have articular processes that forms like zygopophysial joints and these joints usually allow some movement why because uh, this is movement will be based on the orientation of the articular processes then the articular processes also align the adjacent vertebra and prevent them from sleeping now remember that we have um the articular processes will help to bear weight temporarily for example when one rises from a flex position or unilaterally when the cervical vertebra are laterally flexed so the inferior articular processes of l5 vertebra can bear weight even in erect posture so applied aspects we have back pain when all these vertebra have an issue like fracture or um, ligaments are torn, then you can have laminectomy where you can excise the spinous processes that support the adjacent lamina. And when do you do that? To gain access of the vertebral 